Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream on the 14th of November 2023. Martin North here from Digital Finance Analytics. Great to have you on the show tonight and a very important conversation about some of the analysis we've been doing with regards to financial stress, mortgage stress and those sorts of things. And uh, as normal, uh, we will be able to look at individual postcodes. Um, the structure of the show will be, I'll spend the first few moments just going through some of the data charts that really tell the story as to where we are. The second part will be on our stress analysis and I'll show you some of the mapping. And the third part of the show, we'll look at some of the postcodes in detail. I've got a couple of requests already and I'm sure there'll be more coming through. Uh, just to explain that in the early part of the show, I won't be looking at the chat that regularly. So if you've got a specific request for a postcode, park it until the third part of the show and then I can make sure that I actually see it in the chat. Just before I uh, get started though, let me just remind you that um, there are always, of course, uh, a few guidelines here. We don't provide financial advice or legal advice or property advice. This is a general conversation only. Uh, we also moderate the chat, so please play nice in the chat room, but also feel free to chuck your comments and questions in. And uh, always interesting to see what people uh, discuss as we go forward. It's part of the show, of course, very important part. This is as of the 14th of November 23, if you're watching in replay. If you'd like to ask a question, if you put at Walk the World in the question, it'll go right to my queue, and that gives me a much greater chance of seeing it, which uh, will get your question uh, much more noticed. And I've also enabled Super Chat, which means that if you'd like to uh, get your questions top of the list, you can do that via Super Chat or indeed make a contribution to what we do here. Uh, as I've said quite a few times, we don't do this for profit. We do this because we think it's important and any contributions are gratefully received. And we've already received, received one so far. So thank you very much for that. Anyway, let me um, go on now and talk a little bit about some of the data points that we're seeing. Um, there are so many uh, conflicting signals, but I'm afraid that the signals are cohering around significant pressures on households. And just to give you a bit of a, a sort of a sense of that, this actually was one that uh, I saw the other day. It came from AMP and it shows that the average house price has shot up relative to the capacity to pay. And I think this is a very important observation. The capacity of pay, of course, is based on 20% um, deposit, average full-time earnings, and mortgage payments, 20% of income. Um, now, whether that's the right parameter, of course, is an interesting question. But the fact of the matter is we've actually got house prices going one direction. We've got capacity to pay going the other direction. No surprise then that the net result is significant pressure on households. And another way of looking at this is actually from the um, ABS recently. The national average mortgage size has um, risen significantly since 2013. And if you put that in the context of real incomes going backwards over that same period, you can see that we have a real issue with regard to the way that the maths are working at the moment. That's not surprising, therefore, that the retail sector is seeing a significant slide. This is the most recent data. And it's showing that, in fact, the um, working age population spending versus the overall retail sales. And uh, the point there, though, is the volume per person is the thing to look at. Of course, we've got migration. Migration is pumping the economy, but on a per capita basis, we're spending less. And if you break it out even more, what you'll see is that more people are effectively only now making spending on non-discretionary items, things like food and other critical expenditure, discretionary spending is definitely slid close to zero, according to analysis by CBA. Seeing it in the data too. Also, it's worth just highlighting that we're still seeing significant spikes in residential demand for property. This is from the NAB, both for existing and for new. Now, of course, the theory is that foreign investors shouldn't be buying existing property, but it does look as though the demand's rising. But for new, of course, it's quite strong. Another way of looking at that is from data. This is from PropTrack showing that the number of queries with regard to buying and renting searches from overseas property seekers. Um, China, of course, plus New Zealand. Um, and you'll see that the New Zealand story is very much a rental story, but the China story is very much a buy story. So that tells you something. And it's something which uh, Edwin and I have been chatting about uh, 
th on our daily on our weekly rants recently. Now, in talking to the I bet to the vacancy yield rates, of course, they're dropping through the floor. The average rent's gone up by about eighteen percent, according to recent data that I saw. And uh, this is a real pressure, of course, on households. And as you'll see in a second, the rental stress is a real um, big issue off the back of that. Um, also worth bearing in mind, of course, that the CPI weights include housing and that re is relating to new builds and also to rents. And because, of course, new build costs are still rising and rents are rising, it's feeding directly into the inflation number. One reason why the CPI remains high. Another factor, of course, is that there are people talking about more interest rate rises. Warren Hogan, a former ANZ chief economist and now economic advisor to Juno Bank, says further hikes were needed because the economy has had a more meaningful response to heavy rate increases to date. They sh sorry, should have had a more meaningful response. And there's a big debate about whether, in fact, we are going to see uh, more rate rises or not. Um, certainly, looking at all the data I'm seeing, the rates that we've got in Australia are still too low relative to where they should be to really drive the inflation story down. It's worth thinking about the 5.5 or thereabout rates that we're seeing in some other countries, and we're still below that. So there is probably some expectation of higher rates but I'd make the point that even if rates are actually not higher from this point, they're already high enough to be very significant. And uh, as Cookie Boy, Cookie Boy makes the point quite rightly, that it's power, it's rents, it's fuel, insurance, um, which begs the question, how accurate is that uh, really, is that assessment of where the inflation story is? And that's a very important question, I think. Um, I've argued for some time that there's a bit of um, uh, flexibility going on in terms of the way that inflation is reported. And of course, different household groups are also impacted quite differently. Now, the deck servicing costs continue to rise. It's a record high since May and continue to rise. And of course, it's interest rates and higher interest costs that are really biting into households. Also, just in passing, note that the residential builder financial stress continues to go through the roof. Uh, 783 home building firms collapsed compared with 605 last quarter and 238 in the September quarter. So the building and construction sector is also extremely sick. And all of this is taking us into the stress information. Now, Roy Morgan published uh, research recently suggesting about 1.6 million households could fall into mortgage stress if they lifted rates a couple of the times. They've done one since then. So 1.6 million households. Uh, ben Phillips from the ANU using a different method, 30% of the household income, which I think is a very poor measure of stress, is also suggesting a significant rise from 43 to 48.5% of households, which is significant. And of course, as Tarot Brooker highlighted, um, Tarot of course is a bit off air at the moment because she's had a new addition to the family, but uh, the unemployment rate, if it... Um, uh, is going to track as historically you would expect it to rise because we're not generating the 22,000 per month new jobs required with the migration that we've got, migration being very high. Now, it's interesting that there's a big question as to whether the ABS is actually capturing the record immigration levels correctly and how does it translate into the, the population statistics. I've made some adjustments to my models, which I'll talk about in a second, because I don't believe that the ABS is feeding it through. So clearly, the ratio of job applications to job apps compared with unemployment seems to be departing. And another way of looking at the unemployment rate versus the unemployment expectations index is, is splitting apart. So there's something going on. Why isn't employment higher? Um, that's something which we'll need to track very closely because I actually think that the unemployment rate is probably at the moment understating reality. And another way of looking at this, this is the Roy Morgan analysis versus the ABS analysis. And it shows you on a three-month average moving basis, the unemployment rate from Roy Morgan's definition, remember that they actually have a different definition to the ABS, is going up, whereas the ABS number is hardly moving. So the theory I have is that the ABS number is not fully capturing what's going on. Maybe it's lagged, maybe it's to do with the sampling, or maybe it's something else. But certainly in my modeling, I'm having to take higher unemployment data than what the ABS is actually saying from my surveys. 
which takes us quite nicely into the core market model. And for those who've been with me before, you'll be aware of this, but if anyone watching for the first time, we survey households on a rolling basis, put it into the core market model, and we use that for all our analysis. We've been running this since 2001. We can slice and dice the data all sorts of different ways. Think of it like a Rubik cube. And we can also then form some views about where prices might move based on different scenarios. And we'll talk about those scenarios a bit later. The point about this is we take mortgage stress data, the price trajectory and history data, the buying and selling intentions, the migration data, the economic data, things like CPI, wages and employment, put it all into the core market model, run it through the scenarios, and that gives us a postcode level and a rolled up level as to what's going on. And we can also form a view as to where prices might be moving ahead on a scenario basis. Just on passing, I will just say again, we continue to run our one-to-ones. If you want an individual conversation with me about a specific suburb, we can do that. Uh, can't give you financial advice, but I can certainly share all my data. And uh, we can look at the stress, the home price, and all the other stuff that's going on at the moment. And uh, we can have a conversation up to an hour via Zoom or phone. GST is payable on the a fee, unfortunately, because we're still an Australian-based company from a revenue perspective. But that what does that mean? It means that we have to do a bit of work in the background to be able to actually do the analysis. And we're booking three to five weeks ahead. If you're interested in that, go check the uh, DFA blog. There are links and things there. Now let me move on to the definition of stress for those, again, not familiar with how we do it. There are many different definitions. As I said, 30% of income, not a very good one. Taxable income or not is another question. Uh, Roy Morgan uses more sort of parallel to underwriting metrics, but we define stress in cash flow terms, which means households with more outgoings, including one-off discretionary items than income, we define them as stressed. If they have the mortgage, they're in mortgage stress. If renting, they're in rental stress. We can also look at the investor stress too, and also we can aggregate the data to estimate the total financial stress. And as I said before, we look at both the percentage of households and the count. The latter is best, uh, I think, as a measure. It gives you the big numbers, and the big numbers is where all the action is, I think, at the moment. So let's look at the stress data for October. Um, the first thing to say is this is as at the end of October, and rental stress has gone up again to more than 72% of households in the rental sector. That's as high as it's ever been. It's a real, real disaster. More people are just struggling. Mortgage stress is also rising. It's about 50% now. And what's interesting is they're comparing it with pre-COVID. It was about 32. Now it's more than 50%. And by the way, the ratio to income to debt is also quite high. The RBA sort of publishes this, but then keeps tweaking it. But of course, it's not true because it's only one third of households borrowing. So you need to multiply by three to get a better information base. If we then look at quickly the data, this is the latest data for October. You can see there that um, rental stress has really gone up dramatically over the last month in yellow. I've highlighted the change from last month. So far as mortgage stress is concerned, it's gone up in New South Wales, Queensland and Victoria. The overall is also higher. And that gives us 1.9 million households in mortgage stress, 2.2 million in rental stress. And if you aggregate all of those types of stress and investor stress, we've got the total financial stress metric now at 49.64. So nearly half of all households have cash flow issues. That's a big deal and is likely to continue for some time. And as I've uh, highlighted before, of course, we can also analyze it by our different household segments. And uh, younger and families, first time buyers are very much exposed as are those on the urban fringe. But in the rental sector, it's the first generation Australians, uh, those new migrants, multicultural establishments, as I call them. 84% of those in now rental stress, plus a lot of young affluence and young growing families in the rental sector. And from an investment perspective, those with more investment properties like the exclusive professionals and the young affluence are also in some difficulty. So you can see there that it's a real big pain across the board. Now quickly, and I won't go through this in a lot of detail because I made a show earlier, but just to show you that the top coast codes are places like Liverpool in New South Wales, Campbelltown in New South Wales, Tapping in Western Australia, Toowoomba in Queensland, Roxburgh Park in Victoria, and Camden in New South Wales. It's the same old, same olds. Uh, a lot of these are high growth areas, of course, um, but there are also some more affluent postcodes now being more affected, as we'll see shortly. From a rental perspective, the centre of Melbourne is uh, a big deal. 
Toowoomba also high rental stress then we go to Liverpool and then we go to places like Hoppers Crossing um, also in Southport up in Queensland and uh, so it goes on Westmead Campbelltown <coughs> excuse me take a good drink apologies for that um, and the same old same old in so far a place like Ipswich are on the list there too and if we go on to look at some of the uh, stressed investors well centre of Melbourne not surprisingly but also the same areas Westmead uh, Launceston down in um, Tasmania is now showing up as a, a pain point uh, particularly for investors Bundaberg um, and uh, even places like Lane Cove in uh, New South Wales so you can see there's quite a list there even places like Surrey Hills and Darlinghurst some investors now are not getting returns why because the interest rates are a lot higher than they were and that's just putting a lot of pressure on households particularly those with the investment property portfolio because they can't put the rents up more than people can pay and overall if you look at financial stress Toowoomba Liverpool Campbelltown Hoppers Crossing and Tarnit and uh, Roxburgh Park, Craigieburn, Donningbrook, those areas. Um, high growth corridors, uh, as you'd expect in and around the major centres is where a lot of the pain actually is. And here's one more. This is now the default level. So I'm measuring forward estimation of defaults. And you can see there that uh, there are some significant areas now where default levels are beginning to tick up. So places like um, Cranbourne, um, Places like um, Mandurah over in Western Australia, Hobbs Crossing, Armadale, Roxburgh Park. Now, the default counts are still quite low, but the percentage of households expected to have at least a 30 day gap in their payments over the next year is rising. In some cases, it's 6%, 5% of households across the board, quite a lot lower. And we'll be tracking, of course, the, um, uh, the issues with regard to, to the default rates. And let me just make the point here that the default rates as reported in the securitized pools are actually the selected portfolios. So they tend to have a lower default rate than the average. If you look at some of the other portfolios, particularly some of the higher loan to value, higher credit risk areas, particularly some of the non-bank lenders, they've got higher default rates already. And overall, the default rates are rising, but they're rising slowly. And the reason that's important is because the default rates go up not immediately. It takes time for people to get into difficulty, <clears throat> try and refinance a couple of times, but ultimately end up with a difficult position as to what to do. So no surprise then that after the global financial crisis, it was two to three years before default rates hit their peaks. And of course, a lot of people in Australia are saying, well, just hang on in there because rates will go come down next year. The kook actually did a post the other day saying, you know, just hang on in there, do everything you can because by now, my March rates will be lower. Um, I'm not as optimistic as that. I think we're going to see rates higher because inflation is going to be sticky and therefore the RBA will still be pushing the lever to try and actually drive uh, momentum. Now, let me just quickly touch on the scenarios. Um, scenarios are a way just of helping to explore what might be happening. It's not a prediction. It's not a forward estimation, but they are running from this point forward. And I've got three scenarios. The first one is what I call the Goldilocks zone. So basically here you'd expect rates to be at 4.35% but full next year. Inflation eases ahead of the RBA expectations. Wages rise faster. No recession and migration remains well above average. Now the reason I brought migration into this is because it was clear to me that some of the modelling that I was using was not taking full account of where the migration was hitting. So I've now updated the model for that scenario. In the middle scenario, the soft landing scenario, uh, rates go a little higher which means, of course, mortgage rates will go higher too. They stay high in 23 and 24. Inflation stays above target until 25, but no recession in Australia. Migration does begin to fall back towards its average. In other words, the government reacts, or indeed people decide that maybe Australia isn't as great as perhaps they were thinking. And the third scenario, the nightmare scenario, which would be that rates rise above 4.6%, which will put even higher pressure on mortgage rates. They stay high in 24. Inflation stays high. Wages growth stalls further. And uh, the recession sort of grinds in here. Rates then get cut. Migration falls below average. And uh, rates come down, but it's a bit late. 
So those are the three scenarios. And just to give you a sense of what that means, um, this is for the uh, overall Australian house price scenarios. Um, you can see there that um, on this sort of scenario, the best case scenario would be uh, a bit of a rise in house prices over the next three years. Not dramatic, but cumulatively, uh, we could be um, looking at uh, maybe 9%, but most of it in year three. So that's the very best scenario. Um, the more likely scenario is a fall, maybe down 10% over the next three years cumulative. Worst case scenario, a more considerable fall. And as I keep reminding everybody, compared with long-term averages, prices are way over 40% over where they should be. So there's always risk to the downside, but it does depend on what migration does and what interest rates and inflation does. And by the way, if you look at units, there's a little bit of a variation, but not a dramatic variation between the two. So there you go. That's a little bit of uh, how I'm seeing it at the moment. Now, what I might then do is uh, just share with you some of the uh, information with regard to the mapping that we do. So this is the other way of looking at the information. So this is the mortgage stress data currently updated. It's actually Sydney. And you can see here that the colours go from blue where there's very little mortgage stress on account basis to uh, orange and then red where it's actually the most severe. And you know if you look at the uh, story around in around Sydney you can see there that the ring of fire to the west from um, the Blacktown area down through areas of Liverpool and Campbelltown and Camden and places like that. Um, but it's also worth noting that we've got a little bit more now yellow popping up in some of the more eastern suburbs. In other words, areas where you would be less likely to see mortgage stress is beginning to occur. So that's something which we're, we're watching quite closely. Um, obviously, if there is a lot of stress, eventually it could put downward pressure on prices. Although, as we said earlier on, there's still quite heavy demand, particularly migration led. So that's allowing some people to, to get out at the moment if they need to get out. Now, if I then go to, um, let's go to 3000 next and just go into the um, Victorian situation. It's a bit of a similar story insofar that there are areas around the centre of Melbourne that are not too bad. But as you pull out, you begin to see then some significant pressures. But from a count perspective, it's some of those western suburbs, you know, in the Wyndham area, um, which are really up against it, plus of those areas over to the east, um, you know, the uh, areas that you'd expect to see um, down here beyond Dandelong as well as up in north. So we've still got this ring of fire. But again, I'll highlight the fact that we've got now more yellow beginning to appear in other areas um, around the rim of Melbourne. And if we pull out a bit further, of course, we also have places like Ballarat that are actually now registering significant pressure. And um, next door to 3350, 3356 is also now on the way up. So it shows you that we, we're seeing more and more pressure in areas. Remember, I'm reporting this on the percentage of households rather than the, um, uh, sorry, I'm reporting some the number of households rather than the percentage of households. And if we go to uh, 4,000, just to give you a bit of a sense there, it's a bit of a similar story, not quite so severe. Uh, there's been more price movement uh, in Brisbane and the surrounding areas relative to Melbourne. And, you know, I think Melbourne is where there's an interesting lift now in listings. So that way will be an early indicator of price falls ahead. But if you look at the uh, story, again, the Ipswich area and around there, up to the north and down to the south, and even areas around some of the Gold Coast, uh, again, not quite the same counts because the population density is lower, but it is also showing more of a rise in some of those Gold Coast areas. So that's uh, continuing the story. And um, if I go then to 6,000, so in and around Perth, um, a somewhat similar story to last time. But again, what we're seeing is a slightly enhanced yellow set. In other words, more people getting to some more difficulty. Uh, some of that coastal strip is where some of the most significant pressures are. Some of those other areas like Netherlands not doing so badly and Cottesloe not doing so badly. 
Um, but if you go north and south, like places like Wanneroo, that's always been a hot spot, and on the coast, and of course, if you go south, uh, you have a similar issue. So you can see that there are some significant pressure points. And just to highlight that in the Rock and Mandra area, um, it's not a high count relative to some of the other areas, but as we said earlier on, there's a lot of action there too. Now, what I want to do now is to show you the default mapping. Because the default mapping is a bit of a new thing that I've got going. And so this is showing you where the risk of default for the next 12 months is likely to appear. Now, these are 30 day defaults, so it means that somebody might miss a payment and then, you know, fall back into um, being able to continue their payments or not. But it does show you that even some of those more affluent areas, like in the M. Osman area, the Lane Cove area, and Ride area, um, as well as south of the city, we're starting to see a little bit of an uptick in terms of the default risks. And fascinating though it is, you see actually the default risks are not necessarily that much higher over in the Blacktown and Camden areas at the moment. Why is that? Well, it's because some of the people over in these areas are actually already moving to sell their properties. So relatively speaking, I think it's quite an interesting story that some of the pressure points on households are now in some of the more affluent areas in the, around Sydney. Now, if we go to um, Melbourne, it's a somewhat similar story insofar that in and around the centre of Melbourne, there's a little bit of yellow, not vast numbers, but just enough to be a little bit concerning. Uh, and again, as we pull out, what we see is that there are actually high levels of default over in the Wyndham area, 3029, maybe no surprise given what we saw with mortgage stress. And there is a seasoning question here insofar it takes time potentially for households to um, you know, get to the point of having to do stuff. But even places like um, uh, 3977 between Frankston and Casey, for example, or, or North, um, we're starting to see some default risk emerging. But this is the interesting one. If I go to Perth, now, the story of Perth, of course, is that property is booming and prices have gone up and there's no issues. But the default is actually a bit higher risk in some areas in Perth. And the reason for that is that we had very high house prices a few years ago and incomes never really caught up to what was going on. So what we're starting to see now is default risk beginning to emerge. Obviously, it's higher in those pressurized areas where there's high stress, but there is more default in and around the Perth area than many would expect. And the reason for that is that house prices relative to income are still very high, and the costs of living, particularly with inflation, are continuing to rise as well. So those things together are creating a little bit of pressure on, on households. And I make the point that Mandra there is showing up as a significant hotspot. And again, that's a long term issue. So it's not something that's actually just happened in the last six months, 12 months or two years. This is from three to five years ago. And the point there is that the fallout from what's going on takes time to season. And this is uh, one of the things that I keep coming back to. So everyone's saying, well, you know, you'd expect to see massive levels of default. No, you wouldn't. It takes significant amount of time. And of course, we've got the banks being very protective of customers and trying to help them where they can. We've also got uh, various other initiatives out there to try and um, support households. So there's maybe no surprise that the overall absolute default rates remain low. But of course, over time, this could change and the higher interest rates and the fixed to variable moves that are going on will play out eventually. So there you go. That's the latest in terms of the mortgage stress story. Now, what I'm going to do next is to dive into a little bit of analysis with regard to some of the postcodes. And I had a couple of postcodes um, which people asked me about earlier on. So let me just switch view so I can bring the postcode view up. So this is postcode 45. 60, which was one that was asked for before the show started. And um, it's worth highlighting, I think, that uh, you know things are actually looking a little bit concerning here. 
So there's 4, 14,000 households in the postcode and 30% are owning outright. 43.8% are borrowing and 25% are renting. And just to be clear, this is a Queensland postcode in around Nambour 4560. And the first thing to note is that we've got half of households with a mortgage in mortgage stress. We've got 69% of renters in rental stress. We've got some stressed investors and the overall financial stress is around 45%. Now, if we look at the scenarios, um, what we can see here is that in the best case scenario, there is still upside. If you if you believe that interest rates are going to correct and migration is going to remain strong, there is still some upside. But if you take the base case view, then there's a bit of a sort of a fall and uh, the worst case is more significant. Um, I tend to work on the base cases, which shows a little bit, not a massive fall, but a bit of a fall. Now, if we look at the mix of property, 79% are houses, about 5% are units. There's a few other types, things like uh, accommodation over retail, for example. The vacancy rates, about 5% based on the last census data. People ratio is 2.34, so there's a few families there in this particular area. Gross investment yields 4.6, net investment yield 0 0.7. And uh, looking at the taxable income, 67,000 from the ATO or 73,000 from the household census. And this is where really rubber hits the road. So we look at the average disposable monthly income for the postcode at 4539. And 45% is going on the average mortgage payment of just over $2,000 and 41% on the average rent. So that's why the stress levels are so high in this particular postcode. So that's the typical story. Now, somebody asked me for 3064 earlier on. So let's bang that one in. 3064 is Roxburgh Park. Now, I did mention that Roxburgh Park was a problem child. <clears throat> 34,000 households in Roxburgh Park in the Melbourne area and 9% own outright, 64% are borrowing. So look at that leverage, 64%, 26% are renting. And of that, 53% are in mortgage stress, which is more than 11,700 households. Pretty much everyone in rental, um, was in rental stress. There's a bit of investor stress and the overall financial stress metric is quite high at 62.7%. Now, if we look at the mix of property, most of its houses, 91%, very small number of units and other types of property. The people ratio is quite high, so a lot of households there, as you would expect. Vacancy rates about 5% again. The gross investment yield is 3.2. The net investment yield is negative, 0.5%. So property investors are not actually um, covering the costs of their um, rental property, including things like paying the interest and also other repairs on the investment property. And if we look at the scenarios, even on the very best case scenario, over the next three years, there's almost no growth in value. About 4% cumulative over three years is the best case scenario. The base case, which is probably more realistic, is suggesting that there could be a cumulative fall of about 15% over the next three years for houses. And the worst case, a significant fall, of course, which, um, you know, if things go really pear shaped and we get a recession locally, that's what you could be looking at. So it does depend on what happens, particularly with migration and interest rates. Now, looking at the average taxable income, 65,000 for the average individual or 94,000 for the household. Now, that's a very important point. And I did make a show the other day showing that, of course, um, if you take the CBA assumption of two average incomes, going to buy a property, then they actually argued that housing affordability was pretty shot. What this sort of tends to show you is that the individual versus the household, it doesn't tend to double. So that's another unrealistic estimate. So that's why the 94,000 is what I tend to use. Now look at the disposable monthly income, which is 5657. So that's after tax and everything else. And that takes us with a 40% disposable monthly income on the typical mortgage in this postcode and about one third, 33% going on the rent. So if you were to use the old 30% rules, which I don't believe in, you would have to say these were stressed, but they're also stressed on my metrics too. So there we are, that's the story. And um, it's certainly a very, very concerning picture. Now I'm just going back to look at the chat and uh, we'll pick up a few more postcodes and uh, spend a bit more time 
just um, dealing with those. So Bossman says, let's put that one up. 4510. So this is Kabulture. And uh, this is going to be 20,000 households. 23% own outright, 38% are borrowing and 38% are renting. The stress level is relatively low at 18%. The rental stress is high at 89%. Stressed investors is 36%, so it's sort of medium high. And overall financial stress is about 48%. Now, if we look at the mix, 83% are houses, 2.6% are units, 14% are other types of property. People ratio is 2.43, so again, some households not just individuals. Vacancy rate was 6.9% in the census and the investment yield from a gross perspective is 4.5. From a net investment yield it's 0.4%. Looking at the taxable income, the ATO said the individual ATO typically was 62,000. Household census was 68,000. So again, there's not a doubling of incomes between the household and the individual in this particular area. And that gives us a disposable monthly of around 4,400 and 43.1% or 1906 going on the typical mortgage repayment and 36.6% going on the typical rent. So some pressure and uh, certainly it's um, it's a real it's a real issue. Now down under driver said 3075 let's look at that. Now this is Lelo in Melbourne, and uh, about eight thousand in the post in the postcode. Thirty-seven percent are outright, thirty-four percent of borrowing, twenty-eight percent of renting. A lot of mortgage stress, ninety-three percent. A lot of rental stress, sixty-two percent. More than half of households in financial difficulty. Eighty-eight percent of houses, six point two percent of units, and the vacancy is five point five percent. The gross investment yield is three point two. You're pretty much flat net investment yield perspective. And again, looking at the taxable income from the ATO, 63,000 relative to 70,000 for the household. So again, not a doubling of income between the individual and the household in the postcode. And as a result of that, the disposing monthly income is around 4.6 and 46% going on the typical mortgage at more than 2,100 and the typical rent at 37.9% at 1749. And looking at the price project projections for this particular postcode, uh, even with the best scenario, only a very small rise over the next three years, both for units and houses. The base case would see a fall and the worst case would be a more considerable fall. And one of the other observations there um, is that uh, house prices are definitely on the fall uh, as opposed to on the rise. So let's have a look at some of the other ones and see what else we can sort out. Let's go there, press that. Okay. Okay. Blake asks for Altona Meadows three o two eight. Oops. Three o two eight. There we go. Three o two eight. So this is Altona Meadows in Melbourne. 11,000 households, 32% are outright, 38% are borrowing, 29.6% of renting. Mortgage stress is at 43.9%, rental stress at 80%, and there are a few stressed investors. Households in financial stress, overall 43%. Looking at the houses, it's 85%, units 4.1%, and uh, looking at the people ratio, it's 2.37, so some households uh, with families as well as just individuals. The vacancy rate 6.5% last time we had a census. Gross investment yield 3.1, negative investment yield, net investment yield negative minus 0 0.7. The ATO said 72,000 average taxable. The household census said 84,000, so again, not a double. And looking at what well, that means, disposable monthly income is 5347. And looking at that, 38% are going on the typical mortgage at 38%. Um, and 31.8% going 
on Laurenta 1700. And looking at the scenarios, well, if the best case scenario works, you might see growth of up to 7% over the next three years. If you have the base case scenario, it's a bit of a fall of around 12%. Okay, now James asked for 3752. So we'll do that one, 3752. Now this is South Morak in Melbourne again. Um, 8,500 households and owning outright 1642 or 19%. 59% are borrowing, so very significant numbers in leverage. 21% are renting. And 84% of those are actually in mortgage stress. Just take that off so you can see the uh, full screen. 84% um, in mortgage stress, 76% in rental stress, some stressed investors. Overall financial stress at 68% is pretty high. 84% are houses, small number of units. And the people ratio is at 2.9. So again, we've got some households here as well as individuals. The gross investment yield is 3.2, net investment yield is 0 0.2, sorry, 3.2, gross investment yield, net investment yield 0 0.2. Looking at the taxable income, 72,000 typical individual, 108,000 typical household, so you can see their second income contribution much stronger. That gives them a higher disposable monthly income at 6743, which then puts about one third of income going on the mortgage. 2280 typical mortgage payment and 28% on the typical rent. That translates then into a small prospective rise over three years in the best case scenario. But if prices um, move the way that I expect based on the base case, then they'll be down about 16% cumulative over three years. And it's worth highlighting that uh, it's the, you know, over the next 12 months, a bit of a fall, a bit more of a fall and then uh, a continued fall over year three. So no recovery in the short term. Okay, let's see what else we have in terms of other questions. Okay, Cookie Boy asks for 2515. Which is the role? Funny that. Um, okay, so here we have 4,300 households. We have 39% earning outright, 41% are borrowing, 18% are renting. We have the mortgage stress now at 47%. We have the rental stress at 83% and the households in financial stress at 45% overall. 81% of houses, 8.1% of units, a few other types as well. Uh, again, the people ratio is showing it's, it's households rather than individuals at 2.46. Vacancy rate was at 9.3% last time we had a census. Gross investment yield 3.3, net investment yield minus 0.7. The average taxable is 105. The average household is 125,000. So a bit of contribution from second incomes. And overall disposable monthly income around 7,200 with 43% going on the typical mortgage at 3,120 and 37.9% at 2,740 going on the typical rent. Looking at the scenarios, absolute best case is 4.7% over three years. Um, the more likely scenario is a base case of a further slide because I've sold um, some months ago and prices have continued to slide since then. And uh, there isn't much really supporting the market because um, the prices are still relatively out of reach for most locals. And it means that you've then got um, people booking from Sydney who think that Thrill might be more valuable. But nevertheless, it's still a bit of a stretch for many. So that's the story there. So thanks for that one, uh, Cookie. Now down under Drover, oops, let's go there, go there, get that one back up. Yeah. One second, let me get this back on screen, get that chat going. There we go. 3075, 
3075. Okay. This is Lalo. Did I do this one? Uh, I can't remember. I'll do it again anyway in case I didn't. Um, sorry, I don't keep a list because there are too many numbers going through my head. Uh, okay, so this is um, in the Whittlesea area. Uh, 8,300 households, 37% own outright, 34% are borrowing, 28% are renting, 93% in mortgage stress, 62% in rental stress, overall financial stress of 52%. And 88% uh, in houses, 6.2% in units, investment gross, 3.2% net investment yield flat, and the typical taxable income, 63000 versus 70000 for the household. And that gives us a disposal monthly of 4611, which gives 46.2% on the typical mortgage, three one, sorry, 2130, and 37.9% at 1749 on the typical rent. On the scenarios, best case scenario, almost nothing this year, very little next year, maybe a small um, rise in the third year to give 3.2% overall cumulative, but that's the best case. The base case is a fall of about 16%. So there you go. Let's go to the next postcode. Matt says, Four seven four zero. If you get the chance, well, you've got a chance. There we go. Four. Oops. Now you're back to there. Oh, dear. Sorry. Was it? Four seven four zero. Okay. Hang on. Hang on. Let's get this right. Four. So I wish I could type, it would help. <laughs> All right, so this is Mount Pleasant in Mackay. 32,000 households, 25% own outright, 41% are borrowing and 32% are renting. 40% in mortgage stress, 44% in rental stress, a bit of investor stress, but overall about one third of households in financial stress. Looking at the mix of property, 81% of houses, 4.6% of units. The vacancy rate was 9.6% and the people ratio is 2.23, so a little lower than some. Gross investment yield 4.3, net investment yield 0 0.5. The taxable income on average, 86,000 according to the ATO and 95,000 according to the local census. Disposal monthly income 6168, giving 33% going on the typical mortgage which is over two thousand dollars a month and the typical rent at 27.5 percent at 1694. so stress is somewhat lower significant demand so the best case scenario is a rise quite a significant rise over the next three years the base case scenario which is probably closer to the truth is pretty much flat but there's also a downside scenario if things go pear-shaped we get the uh, typical um, concerns with regard to recession coming true Okay, this is 6112. So here we have 25,000 households in Armadale in Western Australia with 12.9% earning outright, 64% are borrowing, 23% are running, so a high growth corridor. 41% are actually uh, in mortgage stress, 93.5% in rental stress. We've got some stressed investors and overall financial stress just over 50%. 90% of houses, very small number of units. People ratio is 2.62, so households again. Vacancy rate was 6.4% in the last census and the gross investment yield is 4.2, net investment yield 0 0.6 positive. Looking at the taxable income, 75000 for the typical individual, 96000 for the household. So we're seeing the contribution from a second income being part of the story here. Disposal of monthly income is 5615 on average, going at 38.5% on the mortgage at 2160 or 28.4% at 1595 going on the typical rent. And looking at the scenarios, best case scenario is a 12% rise in property values over the next three years. 
assuming the best case, as I've discussed previously. The base case is a fall of about 7% over three years, and obviously the worst case, significantly worse than that. All right, going down my list, see what else we can find. Two nine two five nine zero. Thank you very much for the super chat. Greatly appreciated. Yeah, keyboard's working better when you put the power on it. Okay, so this is um, small postcode three thousand. 47% own outright, 28% of borrowing and 24% of renting. Of those borrowing, they're pretty much all recording degrees of stress, both rental and mortgage stress. Um, as I've explained before, when you get small sample sizes, this is a little bit less accurate, but it gives us a directionally um, significant answer. 54% in financial stress. Uh, looking at the houses, 91.6% of houses, small number of units, vacancy rates were 10%, people ratio is a bit lower, and we've got a gross investment yield of 3.1, net investment yield of 0 0.7, and according to the ATO, the average taxable was 70,000, the household census was lower at 53, so that shows you that there's something strange about the household mix in this particular postcode. Nevertheless, disposable monthly is at 3533, which gives us 38.3% or 1354, typical mortgage repayment, and 31% at 1096, typical rental payment. And looking at the scenarios, uh, we're looking very much as a sort of a very small slide, even on the best case scenario, and uh, worse if in fact things go more pear-shaped. Okay, let's see what else we've got here. Osborne Digital Marketing, 3981. 3981. Hope you're doing well, Ronald. Um, now, this is a postcode, of course, with uh, a low count, so always a caveat. This is, um, you know, it, it's, it's not totally accurate. Um, but nevertheless, we've got a lot of people borrowing, 56%, some renting. And uh, as a result of that, we've got not a lot of mortgage stress, but we've got quite a lot of rental stress in the area. We've got 92% houses, a few units. We've got a people ratio of about 2.5, so some households there. We've got a vacancy rate of about 6.5%. We've got the gross investment yield of 3.7. Net investment yield minus 1.3. And the average taxable at 67,000 for the individual at 91,000 for the average household. So again, second income supportive. Gives us a disposable monthly income of about 5331 with 41.5% going on the typical mortgage at 2210 and 29.3% going on the typical rent. And the scenarios are that the best case scenario is a bit of a rise in value, up 9% over three years. The base case is a bit of a small fall, about 10% fall depending on what happens with those different scenarios. Okay, let's have a look. Uh, Travis asks for 4868. Four, eight, six, eight which is Wari in Queensland, up towards Cairns. 8610 households, so just over 8,500. 25% own outright, 41% borrowing, 32.6% renting. Gives us mortgage stress at 41% for mortgage holders and 57% for rentals. And overall mortgage financial, sorry, overall financial stress, 39.1%. Looking at the mix of property, 82% of houses, 8% of units. We've got a people ratio of 2.4. We've got a vacancy rate of 5.9. And we've got the gross investment yield of 4.5. Net investment yield positive 0.7. Average taxable, 
68,000 according to the ATO and 80,000 according to the household census. So a little bit of second income support there, giving a disposable monthly income around 5246 with 34.7% going on the mortgage at 1820 and 33% at 1745 going on the typical rent. Looking at scenarios, some upside if things go positively based on the best case scenario, 16.4% over three years. The base case is a small fall. Okay, I'll do one Burjo, 4570. So this is a mother mountain in Wide Bay Burnett. I'll take the chat off so you can see the full story. Okay, 18,000 households, 30% outright, 39% are borrowing, and 22% are renting. Looking at the mortgage stress, 41% in mortgage stress, 64% in rental stress, overall financial stress at 38, a little bit lower. Uh, looking at the mix of property, 92% of houses, small number of units, people ratio is just above two, vacancy rates around nine, and the gross investment yield is 4.8, net investment yield positive, 0 0.7. Taxable income is about 64, the household income is about 60, so uh, interesting, it's a little bit lower. That gives a disposable monthly of around 3739 on average, with 41% or 1560 going on the typical mortgage, and 39% going on the typical rent at 1470. Looking at the scenarios, best case scenario, again, Queensland doing better than many other parts of the country. Cumulative 14.5% over three years, best case, um, the base case, a small fall. Okay. So our Mohit says 6156. Which is Atterdale in the area of Brand. So 7,200 households, 33% owning outright, 40% 44.9% borrowing, 22% renting. Rental stress at 39%, a little lower than some other areas. 43% in rental stress and you can see there that overall financial stress is a little bit on the low side. So this means that 70 70%, 77% of houses, 3.2% of units and around 90% other types of property. People ratio is 2.3 and the gross investment yield is 4.3, net investment yield 0 0.9. Typical taxable 107,589 from the ATO and 111,000 from the household census. So a small contribution from second incomes, but not dramatically high. Disposable monthly incomes, 6336, with 41.6% .6 going on the typical mortgage, 2639, and 29.1% at 1843 going on the typical rent. And you can see here that the best case scenario is a cumulative rise of about 15% over three years. The base case, is a small rise, then a bit of a fall, overall cumulative fall of about 3%. Worst case, of course, is more significant. Uh, Lee says, thank you for the super chat, Lee, greatly appreciate it. And uh, you haven't asked for a postcode, so I appreciate the super chat and I'll move on. Thank you very much for that. Okay, here's one. Six one zero zero. Which is Latham in Western Australia in the federal seat of Swan. So seven three three five households of twenty percent on outright, thirty percent of borrowing and forty five percent of renting. And the mortgage stress is 25%, the rental stress is 77%, and that gives a total financial stress measure of more than 62%. Looking at the houses, 43%, 29% in units, and there's also other types of property there too. 
people ratio is quite a lot lower, including some individuals as well as households, I would suggest. And the vacancy rate was 12%. 4.2% gross investment yield, 0.4% net investment yield. Typical taxable income, 90,000. Household census says 98,000. And looking at the disposable monthly income, that translates to about 6,375. And on average, 37.6% are going on the typical mortgage at $2,400 or 27.4% at 1745 going on the typical rent. Looking at the price scenarios, best case scenario, 10% over three years if things go really well. The base case to fall about 9% cumulative. Worst case, of course, is a lot worse. So Lee said two four six four. So this is Yamba on the north coast. And this is three two two five in terms of households, fifty percent own outright, twenty two percent of borrowing, twenty seven percent of renting. Not much mortgage stress but quite a lot of rental stress going on and overall stress about 27%. Looking at the mix of properties, 76% of houses, 5.5% of units, and there's also quite a lot of other types of property there too. The people ratio is quite a lot lower, so there'll be some individuals as well as households. And the high vacancy rates are 24%, so this is probably going to be second homes and also Airbnb, that type of situation. Looking at the gross investment yield, 3.4, net investment yield minus 0.6. And the typical taxable income at 69,000. Household census was 59,000, giving a disposable monthly of 3858, with around 50% going on the average mortgage at 1930 and 51.7% at 1933 going on the typical rent. Scenarios. Because of the low stress levels here, and uh, everything else, there's a potential best case of about an 11% rise over three years. The base case is a bit of a fall, about 8% cumulative, and obviously the worst case is worse. Okay, let's see what else we can find. Uh, Another from one Burjo, 4570. Uh, done that one, haven't I? Mother Mountain, Mother Mountain, yes, I've done that one. So I won't do it again. But Steve has asked for 4053, so we'll try that one. So this is McDowell in Brisbane and Morton. 19,000 households, 23.5% own outright, 40% of borrowing, 35.7% of renting. We've got 42% in mortgage stress, we've got 81% in rental stress, and we've got 58% in households overall financial stress. We've got 76% in houses and 11% in units, plus some other types there. People ratio is 2.38, so that's going to be um, households, not just individuals. The gross investment yield is 4.7, which is sort of the higher end. Net investment yield 1.1. Average taxable 83,000. The household census at 111,000, so you're seeing multiple incomes there going into help the disposable monthly income at 6958, with 35.6% or 2476 going on the mortgage and 29.4% going on the typical rent. And you can see there that the best case scenario is a cumulative rise of 10% over three years. The base case is a bit of a fall of about 9% over three years. Let's have a look and see what else I've got here. Uh, 
I'm getting a bit behind on the chat, so I may miss some. If I do, I apologize. Um, it's always complicated when there are so many people wanting information. 4131. Which is Logan Lee in the area of Springwood. And there we've got just about 4,000 households with 12% earning outright, 29% of borrowing, and 57% of renting. We've got a lot of mortgage stress, a lot of rental stress, and overall financial stress is 94%. That's pretty high. 76% of houses, 8.5% of units. And we've got a uh, people ratio of 2.66. The gross investment yields 4.6, and uh, the net investment yields 1.3%. And looking at the taxable income 59,000 compared with 71,000 from the census so a bit of double income flowing in there it's giving a disposal monthly income of around 4799 with 37.9% or 1820 going on the typical mortgage and 36.3% at 1745 going on the typical rent scenario is looking at the best case scenario pretty much flat over the next 3 years the base case would give a fall of about 18% over 3 years So we got thank you for the super chat appreciate that greatly appreciate it it certainly helps to uh, cover some of the costs of what we do whoops okay, that up again. okay let's have a look Pete says 4101 We'll give that one a go. Four, one, oh, one. Okay. Highgate Hill in Brisbane and Morton, fifteen thousand six hundred, with fifteen percent earning outright, twenty-one percent borrowing, sixty-three percent renting, rental stress, eighty-two percent mortgage stress, sixty-nine percent, and overall financial stress is pretty aggressive as well. Only 16% of houses, most of them are units, 79.7%. And the people ratio is quite a lot lower. So a lot of individuals as well as some families. The vacancy rate is quite high at 15% as well. The gross investment yield is 5.3. Net investment yield is 1.5. Tax, average taxable. Sorry, the dog is just rattled. <laughs> Luna's got up and is walking around. 96,000 for the typical ATO and 102 for the typical household census. Giving a disposable monthly of around 6993 with 34.8% or 2437 going on the typical mortgage and 32.1 2243 going on the typical rental. Looking at the price scenario, small rise, best case at 4% over three years cumulative, base case a small fall around 15% over three years. And George makes the point Australians can no longer afford property I'm afraid that's about right okay this one Glenfield 2167 okay so this is in the area of Campbelltown um, but some one of the smaller suburbs 3422 households with 18% only outright 46% of borrowing, 35.3% of renting, high mortgage stress at 73%, high rental stress at 81%, overall financial stress 66%, so two thirds. 69% of houses, there's also some other types of property there too. People ratios 2.86, so we're going to see some families as well as individuals. Vacancy rates 4.5%, the gross investment yields 2.3, sorry, 3.2, and the Net investment yields minus 0.5%. Average taxable 72,000. Household is 107. So again, contribution from second income there. And that gives a disposal monthly of around 7249, which means that 35.9% or 2,600 going on typical mortgage and 28.9% at 2093 going on the typical rent. 
And looking at the scenarios, the very best case scenario is a small rise of about 3% cumulative over three years. The base case, a fall of 17. The worst case, a fall of 38. Okay, what else have we got? Justin says 2117 will be interested. Okay, let's try that one. 2117 in Dundas Valley in Sydney. 8,000 households, 24% own outright, 38% are borrowing, 37% are renting. 24% in mortgage stress, 87% in rental stress, some stressed investors, and of course households are in financial stress, so overall 54%. Giving 53% as houses, 13% as units, and 33% other types of property. People ratio is 2.53, so households as individuals. Vegas rate at 8.4. Gross investments 3.4, net investment positive 0 0.1. Average taxable 87,241. Average household, 96,768. So you can see a slight contribution from second incomes there. Disposal monthly income, 5,947. Giving 52.5% or 3,120 on a typical mortgage and 38, sorry, 34.9% going on the typical rent at 2,078. And 52.5%, that's one of the highest I've seen. So more than half of the disposal monthly income now going on the mortgage in this particular area. As I said, a lot of people borrowing, so a lot of people are leveraged to the hilt. Certainly could be a problem later. Jonathan says, I'd be interested in Abbotsford 3067. Sure, I can do that. OK, 307, yeah, Abbotsford indeed. Abbott's Food, sorry. Um, 4667, only 14% own outright, 30% are borrowing, 55% are renting. It's an inner city Melbourne, wondering if there's a divergence here, says Jonathan. Yeah, looks as though, look at that rental, 55%. Looking at the mortgage stress, 38% of those borrowing, but 76% of those renting, significant. Um, stressed investors, up a bit, 39%. Overall financial stress, 67.9%. 10% of houses, 62% of units, so that's consistent with high uh, investment uh, properties. Other types of property there too. People ratio is a lot lower, that's usually what we expect, more individuals rather than just um, households. A lot of vacancy there as well. That could be a lot of new bills possibly, I don't know. 3.9% gross investment. Net investment yield is flat. <coughs> And uh, looking at the average taxable, 93,000. Household, 114,000. So a bit of contribution from second income there. Typical disposal monthly, 7,920, with 32% going on the typical mortgage at 26 and 26.7% going on the typical rent. So it's worth observing it's a smaller proportion of the overall income, which is slightly higher than some other postcodes we've seen, but the mix of property in this area is quite different and the rental is significant. Put that all together, we are saying there could be a significantly positive story of about 5% over three years in the best case scenario, but a fall of 14% in the more likely scenario. And you make a very important point here. The mix of different types of property is worth looking at. Okay, see what else I've got. Chris says four one two one. The dog has just come to say to hello. They obviously think it's time for lunch. It's a bit early, but um, they're always keen. Hello. What are you doing? Hey. Eh? Yes. Just having to pat the dog. Excuse me for a second. All right, 412. <laughs> um, we've got um, Holland Park here, 9850 with 24% earning outright, 46% of borrowing, 28% of renting, 
Mortgage stress at 41%, rental stress at 71%. Some stressed investors, overall financial stress at 47%. 84% of houses, 11% of units. Uh, people ratio is a bit higher, so households, not just individuals. Vacancy rates, 5%. Gross investment yields, 4.5. Net investment yields, 0.7. And taxable income at 97 compared with 127,500 for the census. So again, second income contributing, giving a disposable monthly income around 7,417. 38% going on the mortgage at 2,812 and 27.6% going on the typical rent. And from a scenario perspective, best case scenario is a rise of around 13% over three years in this particular area. Base case a fall of about 6% over three years. All right, let's see what else we've got. James says 4068. So, Indra Pili, 10,500 household. 26% own outright, 30% are borrowing, 43% are renting. We've got 43% in mortgage stress, we've got 72% in rental stress. Overall, 60% of in financial stressed households. We've got 44% in houses and 47% in units. We've got a people ratio of 2.26, so a little higher, so there'll be some households, not just individuals. The vacancy rate was 7.7%, gross investment yield was 4.6, net investment yield was 1%. Average taxable, 113. Average household, 108, so a little contribution from second incomes giving a disposable monthly income around 6901 with 36.5 going on the typical mortgage and 29.6% going on the typical rent scenarios. Best case, 9% positive over three years. The base case, a fall of about 10% over three years. Okay, another one. Three nine seven seven. Three nine seven seven. Cranbourne. Yes. Now Cranbourne, of course, appeared in my stressed analysis earlier on. So thirty-eight six five eight households. Fourteen percent own outright. Sixty-one percent are borrowing. More than twenty-three thousand households. Twenty-four percent are renting. Mortgage stress is at 39.8%. Rental stress is at 87%. 53% of households are in financial stress. We've got 87% in houses and uh, a small number of units. We've got a people ratio that's quite high. So a lot of households here, nearly three. And looking at the investment yield, 3.4 gross, minus 0.5% net. The average taxable, individual 67,000. Household, 98,000. So you can see the contribution there of second incomes, giving a disposable monthly income of around 5,500 with 41.6% going on the mortgage, 2288, and 34% 1894 going on typical rent. Looking at the scenarios, the best case scenario is a rise of 5% over three years, base case a fall of 14%. And I'll make the point that this is one of those areas where there's very significant migration, so demand for property actually is quite high and that's one of the reasons why the numbers are coming out the way they are in this particular postcode. Okay, Steve asks for 4887 up in North Queensland. Four eight eight seven, which is Herberton. Herberton. Now low count, very low count here, so be you may be cautious on these estimates. There, you know, 823 households is a low number. A lot of people own outright. There are some borrowing and some renting. The mortgage stress is not really showing. The rental stress is there, but not dramatic. Um, from a mix of property, it's mostly houses, small number of units, a lot of vacancy. So there could be Airbnb and um, second homes and those sorts of things in the area. People ratio is quite low. Gross investment yields 4.2, net investment yields flat. Average taxable 62, average households 49. So there's some, some part-timers there, I suspect. And looking at the disposable monthly, 
3393 with 38% going on the typical mortgage 1300 and the typical rent 33.81147. Looking at the scenarios, um, some significant upside potentially, um, 20% over the next three years. Um, even the base case says um, a little bit of growth, only marginal, but um, the worst case a fall. So very unusual postcode, but I must caveat this with these postcodes on such low counts are obviously more statistically um, risky than the, the normal. Okay, what else do we see as we go down the list? Um, stripey cat, high stripey, 3977. How are we doing on time? Yep. I'm going to run out of runway soon, so we'll try and get through as many as we can. 3977, this is in the area of Cranbourne. Um, 38,000, I may have done this one, I'm not sure, but anyway, I'll just quickly go through it because it's such a significant one. 14.1% on outright, 61.7% borrowing, 24% renting, 39% in mortgage stress, 87% in rental stress, overall more than half in financial stress, 87% of houses. The vacancy rate is quite low. The people ratio is quite high. And gross investment yield is 3.4. Net investment yield minus 0.5. You can see here the average taxable income, 67,000 individually, but 98,000. So there's a contribution from second incomes, giving a disposable monthly of 5501. 41.6 going on the typical mortgage. 33, 34.4% going on the typical rent. And uh, best case scenario, a small rise, but the base case are bit of a fall over the next year or two. Okay. VJ says 3152. Okay, this is in the area of Knox, in the federal seat of Aston. 12, 8, 9, 6 households. 30% out right, 42% are borrowing, 21% are renting, half are in mortgage stress, 90% are in rental stress, overall financial stress at 48%. 82.9% are houses, a small number of units. People ratios 2.6, so some households there, not just individuals. Gross investment yield 3.4, net investment yield minus 0 0.6. Average taxable 77. Average household 98, so a bit of contribution from second incomes, giving a disposal monthly of 5855 with 44.4% or 2600 going on the mortgage and 36.7 or 2148 dollars per month going on the typical rent. Scenario, best case 4% cumulative over three years, base case a fall of 16% over three years. Okay, what else are we going? Matt, thank you very much for the super chat. Greatly appreciated. 7173. This is Dodge's Ferry in South Tasmania. Relatively small postcode, 3000. A third on outright, 50% are borrowing, 15% are renting. A lot of mortgage stress, 95% in mortgage stress. A lot of rental stress, so a lot of financial stress in and around the area. It's pretty much all houses and the gross investment yields 4.8, net investment yields 0 0.9. People ratio is quite high, so a lot of families in the in the area there. And uh, looking at the taxable income, 64 for the individual, 71 for the household, so line ball really there. Disposal monthly is 4648 with a third going on the mortgage at 1560 and 35% going on the typical rent at 1645. Looking at the scenarios, even the best case scenario I'm predicting from the scenarios, a small fall, about 4% over the next three years, a more significant fall if uh, things go more pear-shaped. And you also asked about 7172, so we'll go there as well, 7172, which is sort of next door. This is Sorel. It's a very low count, so be cautious of this. 33% own outright, 42% are borrowing, 23% are renting, 90% in mortgage stress, 100% in rental stress. So stress levels are quite high. Pretty much all houses again. Um, gross investment yields 5.4, net investment yields 2.1, that's one of the better ones. 
Typical average taxable, 62,000 versus 70,000, giving a disposable monthly of about 4,369 with 41.7% or 1,820 going on the typical uh, mortgage and 39.9% or 1,745 going on the typical rent. And again, scenarios are a fall down 5% best case and a more significant fall if we get the uh, uh, rate rises continuing as I possibly expect they would. And thanks very much for the super chat. Greatly appreciated as always. Really helps to keep the show going. Wednesday says 3040. Give it a go. We're running down to the clock. This is in Essendon. And this is 11,000 households. 31% and outright. 34% of borrowing. 33% of renting, 95% in mortgage stress, 71% in rental stress, uh, overall financial stress is 71%, half of houses, significant number of units is there as well. People ratio is 2.16, so a bit on the lower side, so there'll be some individuals as well as households. Gross, and fields, gross investment yields 3.3, net investment yields minus 0 0.4, average taxable 104, average household 114, so a little bit of contribution potentially from some second incomes. Disposable monthly on average 6754 with 42% going on the typical mortgage at 2860 and 28.4% at 1918 going on the typical rent. And looking at the household scenario, sorry, looking at the property scenarios, best case, a fall of about 2% over the next three years, so pretty much line ball. But if we get uh, higher rates, then a fall of about 22% is more likely. Okay. Thank you very much for the super chat, uh, Christopher. Greatly appreciated. Really helps to cover some of the uh, cost of doing what I do here. Um, always uh, greatly appreciate super chats. Okay. Um, another one here. 3130. What I'm going to do in a moment is I'll just break off from this and uh, just close the show. And then if there's a few more. I'll cover them before I sign off finally. Okay, so this is Blackburn in Melbourne at 13,000 households with 36% earning outright, 38% borrowing, 24% are renting. And uh, the stress levels, 33%, so, you know, lower than some, but still there. 77% in rental stress, overall 41%. 73% of houses. We've got a people ratio of 2.38. We've got the gross investment yield at 3.4, net investment yield minus 0 0.2, so a bit of a fall. Average taxable, 89,000. Household census, 103,000, so a bit of contribution from second incomes, giving a disposable monthly of 6,220, with 44% going on the typical mortgage at 2,760, and 33 going on the typical um, rent at 2,064. Looking at the scenarios, best case scenario, a rise of 7% over three years. The base case is a fall of about 12%. Okay. So what I'm going to do now, let me just come back to the uh, main screen here and uh, go back to the um, other story. Um, insofar that let me close the show out and then I'll just do a few more if I have time afterwards. Um, as with all of these things, there's always more uh, to do than time to do them. Unfortunately, it's just the way things go with this sort of uh, show. Um, but I will tell you how you can get an individual postcode uh, data point if you'd like one at the end of the show, if you stay with me. Now, let me just make two quick points. The first point with mortgage stress, I'm looking at household cash flow and it still amazes me how many households have very little sense of what their cash flows actually are. So about half of households have some sort of cash flow. A lot of people don't. So it is worth getting to know your cash flow. And the ASIC has some um, on the smart money site, some templates that you can use. So understand where the money is going, where it's coming. Um, then you can prioritize. And so one of the things I often say to people is it's really useful to get and understand cash flow because you can then prioritize. 
Um, the second point is if you have a mortgage and you've got um, cash flow issues, um, it is worth talking to your bank, but go in armed because what the banks will tend to do will be to offer to extend the mortgage over a longer period or maybe go interest only or even give you repayment holidays for a little period of time. Um, that is in their interests, not necessarily your own interests. So it's worth doing the work before you speak to the bank, but they are there to help. They have a legal obligation from the hardship perspective. If you're in the rental sector and rental is horrendous at the moment, um, you know, a lot of people are struggling to work out what to do. Um, do they try and get somewhere cheaper? Uh, do they try and negotiate a longer rental term? It is really tricky. Um, the thing to do, I think, is to try and to make sure that you keep on the right side of your landlord. But of course, the landlord is under huge pressure with the mortgages on the rental property as well. So there's, there's, it's, a, it's a huge issue. And I can't really say other than manage your cash flow and prioritize your spending is the best um, observation there. Now, both um, whether you're renting or whether you're actually um, in the um, in the mortgage area, be careful about just getting more credit. So more credit doesn't necessarily solve a lot. And uh, it is worth just highlighting, I think, that the um, story quite often is that people get themselves into difficulty through trying to get additional credit or buy now, pay later. So skinny back some of that. And the final point to make here is if you need to get some advice, um, I recommend the National Debt Outline 1-800-007-007. Uh, this is a sort of government-backed um, advice, so it's more independent. Just be careful. Don't just Google financial advice or debt help on the internet because you're going to end up with firms that will charge you for doing things that they shouldn't charge you for. And uh, you can get just into a worse situation rather than the better situation. But, you know, the bottom line is this. We are seeing households now under significantly more pressure. I don't expect interest rates to come down anytime soon. So it's down to individual households to try and get their arms around their financial situation as best they can. But sometimes, sometimes the best move is if you've got a mortgage that you can't service, um, rather than just uh, struggle on and try and work your way through. Sometimes going on the front foot and saying, well, maybe I should think about selling. Prices at the moment are still relatively um, high, so you can potentially yield some equity out of that. Um, you know, it's worth thinking about, but there's no easy answers. So get advice and um, try and um, figure out the, uh, the best way to do it. OK, so with that said, um, for those who uh, want to disappear now, um, thank you very much for spending some time with us. Um, I will just show you the dogs briefly here. Um, that's Luna sound asleep, Meteor somewhere around, which is over there on the other side, so you won't see her here. But um, just to say that next week um, I'll uh, be back on with uh, Leif Van Onselen and we're going to talk about some of the analysis he's been doing with regard to, to migration. And the following week, We've got Adam Stokes coming back on to talk about crypto. So uh, that's the next two weeks teed up. So if you want to stay with me and go through a few more postcodes, I'm happy to spend a few more moments just before I sign off finally. But uh, if you um, feel that uh, you've reached your time, you're dismissed. Uh, thanks for spending some time with us. And I look forward to seeing you next week and catch up on the recorded shows. Meantime, and in the meantime, I'll go back to my um, other screen and we'll see whether we can do a few more postcodes before I sign off finally. So 5116 was asked for so let's try and do that. Okay so this was uh, Everston Park in the Adelaide area 4486 with 24% earning outright, 43% borrowing, 30% renting, 80% in mortgage stress, 47% in rental stress, overall financial stress at 51.4%, 80% houses, and uh, the vacancy rates 3.9%, uh, net investment yields positive 0.5%. The individual income 67,000, the ATO household 67,000, so that gives a disposal monthly of 4508 with 36.9 going on the typical mortgage at 1664 and typical rent of 33.2%, 1495. And that gives um, uh, an overall scenario of positive 15% over three years in the best case scenario. Base case, a fall of about 4%. Just working quickly down the list as best I can. 
Angela says 2527. Albion Park down on the south coast, 9559 with 25% earning outright, 53% borrowing, ooh, that's high, 21% renting, 30% in mortgage stress, 79% in rental stress, and the overall financial stress at 37%. 84% of houses, some units and other types of property there too. PP ratio is 2.67, so a number of households was individuals. The vacancy rates are very low at 3.7%. Gross investment yields 3.3, net investment yield minus 0.1. Average taxable 77,000 per individual and 97,000 per household. So you can see their contribution of second incomes. And that gives a disposal monthly of about 5951, 43% going on the mortgage at 2,600, that's pretty high, and 37.7% at 2,243 going on the typical rent. And from a scenario perspective, the best case scenario would be a small rise, about 9% over the next three years. That's driven by quite high demand, particularly from some migrants who come down to that area. And um, the base case, a fall of about 10%. Four one eight four. Russell Island. Four three six one with half only outright. Twenty five percent borrowing and twenty four percent of renting. A lot of rental stress, not a lot of mortgage stress. Mostly houses. Uh, very low people ratio. I suspect this is probably an area where they've got Airbnb and. You know a lot of um, holiday homes as well gross investment yield 4.5 net investment yields positive 0 0.6 the taxable income 60,000 per individual and household 39,000 so that was again an indication of, of part-time occupation deposit monthly income it's very low 2539 with 42% going on the average mortgage and 51% going on the average rent but caveat that with what I said in terms of the population mix. Scenarios are positive, 14% over three years, best case scenario, a bit of a fall, the base case scenario. Okay, I'm gonna do just a couple more. Oh, it looks like we may have, no, no, there's a go. Four, five, five, six. I keep thinking I got to the end and I can see another one. So this is Bundarim in the Sunshine Coast. 18,000 households, 33% own outright, 41% are borrowing, 25% are renting, 32.5% in mortgage stress and 71% in rental stress. Overall financial is 38%. 73% of houses, 10% of units and some other types. Vacancy rate's quite low. The people ratios showing somehow some households probably there. Gross investment yields, 4.6. Negative investment, no, net investment yields, positive 0 0.8. 81,000 taxable income, 87,000 household census income, giving a disposal monthly of 5,453, with 44% going on typical mortgage of 2,400, and 41% at 2,247 going on typical rent. Scenario, best case, 15% over three years. Base case, a fall of about 4% over three years. And um, I make the point that some of these uh, areas, particularly around the Sunshine Coast, have got quite high um, contributions because the mortgages are pretty leveraged up. Okay, what have we got there? Okay, full one. Rio. Okay, so this is in the um, Brisbane and Moreton Bay area, 3,000 households, 28% and outright, 57% are borrowing, 13.7% are renting, a lot of mortgage stress, quite a lot of rental stress, overall financial stress very high, 91% are houses, some units, people ratio is quite high, and the vacancy rates are 4.2% on the low side, 4.7% gross investment yield, 1.1% net investment yield, average taxable income, 83,000 for the individual, 120,000 for the average household, so contribution from second income, 
giving a disposal monthly around 6970, which is 36.2% going on the mortgage at 2522 and 30% at 2118 going on the typical rent. And from a scenario perspective, positive 4% over three years, best case, fall of about 15% over three years, my base case. Okay. So I'm going to do one last one. Dominion asked for 810. Now let's see whether I can get that one up for you. Some of the NT ones are a bit of a problem because of the low. There we go, 810 low accounts, but this is um, a good one. OK, this will be the last postcode for the night. Um, 12,000 households with 17% owning outright, 35% borrowing and 46% renting. We've got some degree of stress, but it's not as high in some other areas. We've got 63% in houses, 24% in units. We've got some vacancies around 7%. And we've got a gross investment yield of 5.5, net investment yield of 1.5. Average taxable, 83. Average household, 114. So second income contribution there coming through. And the disposable monthly income is more than 7,000, which gives you a 32.7% uh, contribution to 470 going to the mortgage or 22.7% 1719 going to the rent. So it's interesting some of the Northern Territories are actually um, seeing it's quite high disposal monthly income so some of the stress is a bit low. And looking at the scenarios, best case scenario is a significant rise over the next three years. Um, even the base case is suggesting a small rise and that's because of low stress and significant demand in the area. And there we are. That's it. So thank you very much indeed for uh, spending some uh, of your Tuesday evening with us. Hope you found that helpful. And uh, as always, I'll continue to update the models and uh, make sure that we um, continue to uh, share the information with regard to what's going on. I think this is a very important conversation to have. And I want to make the point that it's not just, um, you know, out of suburban areas and some of the major cities, but quite a few other people now getting caught. So it's worth uh, understanding your cash flow and um, thinking about how to deal with it. So thank you very much for spending some time with us. Um, the dogs are as they were. <laughs> Luna's still there. The other one's tucked around the corner, so I can't show her at the moment. But uh, with that, thank you very much. Have a good evening. I look forward to seeing you next week and uh, look forward to uh, continuing the conversation with what's going on. This is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics signing off. Cheerio.